Okay, great. Well, let's let's begin. So, a very warm welcome to this keynote lecture by Professor Jen Snowball as part of King's College London's Africa Week 2022. My name is Jonathan Gross. I'm a lecturer in the Department of Culture, Media and Creative Industries here at King's, and I'm delighted to be chairing today's session. Before introducing Professor Snowball, just to let you know the format for today's event. Jen will speak for around 40 or 45 minutes. We will then have plenty of time for questions and discussion. So whilst listening to Jen, please do be thinking about any questions you would like to ask or comments you would like to share following the talk. Jen Snowball is Professor of Economics at Rhodes University, South Africa. She is also a researcher at the South African Cultural Observatory, SACO. Her research interests are focused mainly in the fields of cultural economics and environmental economics. Her research work in cultural economics has included developing and testing a framework for the monitoring and evaluation of publicly funded arts and culture, cultural mapping studies, employment in the cultural and creative industries, and international trade in cultural goods and services in emerging markets. She has published widely in the economics of arts and culture and is a board member of the Association for Cultural Economics International. Today, Professor Snowball will be speaking to us on the topic, capturing value in the cultural and creative economies in Africa. Jen, a very warm welcome to you and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Jonathan, and um, the organisers for inviting me. Um, I'm just going to share slides and hopefully that will work well. Is that all good? Can you? Thanks. Okay, so um, the topic that I was sort of suggested to me today is this very broad one about capturing value in cultural and creative economies um, in Africa. And so um, I've sort of thought long and hard about um, what exactly to highlight here um, because it's such a broad and important topic. And so um, what I've decided to do um, is to have a kind of structure where I talk a little bit about cultural value, where does cultural value come from, um, reminding us a little bit about theories and types of value, um, and then to, to to talk about two case studies or examples of recent research I've been involved in um, and how that relates to cultural value. So the first one is on the repatriation of African museum artifacts with the question there be relating to, well, does cultural value depend on context? Um, and then thinking about the creative industries and the impact of COVID-19 and what happened to kind of live performing arts and especially festivals, um, I'd like to talk about the project actually that Jonathan's also involved in called Future Festivals South Africa. And then finally wrap up with thinking about, um, well, how does this all fit into ideas of cultural policy and how cultural policy should look and what it should do. Um, and maybe a bit about the rise and fall of economic or financial value as being one of the, uh, the, the main ways to capture festival value. Okay, so firstly, um, the question that, that I ask myself is, is, how does culture come to be recognized as valuable? And of course, as you all know, it's about meaning and meaning that flows from identity. Um, so an, an artifact or um, a custom um, or, or music fashion becomes valuable because it means something. And it means something because it speaks to your individual or social identity. And if we think of it in an economic sense, these values are produced and exchanged through a whole lot of different kinds of interactions, social interactions, events um, like festivals um, or fairs, everyday interactions, um, formal consumptions so that would be buying something, but also production and participation. So uh, professional or amateur kind of activities. Um, and I'm particularly interested in events because we can think of them as a kind of marketplace for ideas. So this is where uh, cultural expressions of various kinds become valued or are valorized. So if we think of 
of this as a place where value is ascribed, agreed on, but also changed. Right? So my context being South Africa, um, and, and I was kind of at university when there's this change from apartheid to democracy, and then we see really sort of sudden changes um, in valorization and cultural value, and I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, this is a kind of a very a basic framework that I'm sure lots of people have worked with in thinking about different kinds of cultural value. So intrinsic cultural values are those that are unique to the culture itself. Um, and the aim of producing the artwork or dance uh, or whatever it is, the artifact, um, in the first place. So this is what's sort of thought of as art for art's sake. Um, and when you talk to creatives about uh, what exactly this means, then they would say, well, our, our, what was the aim of making this thing? Well, it was to entertain or to delight, but sometimes also to challenge, um, to question us, to make us think about things, um, to make us think about national identity and pride or to educate us. Um, instrumental values are the ones that are not really unique to culture. So in other words, um, other things could result in these values as well. So it's not the primary purpose of the cultural production. So an example could be, well, you know, tourist spending relating to attending a festival um, that feeds into economic growth and development uh, and employment um, or infrastructure investment or enhancing the image of the country or of the, um, or of the city that might be hosting this um, cultural event. Um, and then, what I find quite interesting is where does social value fit into this, right? So uh, talking to some creatives, they would say, well, social values are really instrumental as well. Sport also provides uh, feelings of unity and pride and so on. Um, and, and so that's that you should see them separately. Um, some economists think that they are actually intrinsic. That's one of the main values of the creative industries. So, I try to draw something that kind of captures this and I've put social under the instrumental. Um, so instrumental values would be the economic values broadly understood as impacts on the economy, uh, social values um, relating to that feeling of national identity, pride, social cohesion and so on. And intrinsic values being those um, kind of personal art for art sake values. Um, and when it comes to thinking about these, um, the reason that I think the economic value has got so much um, exposure and use is because it's easy to measure. It appears to be objective uh, and it's, it's quantitative, right? Um, social values are still measurable and to some extent objective, um, and you can measure them using quant and qual, but intrinsic values are really the hardest to measure. Right? They're very difficult to to put some kind of a, a value on and they're subjective. And so I think that um, we've kind of defaulted to the economic quite a lot in some ways because this appears to be one of the easiest things to, to measure. Um, and what South Africa has seen, which I'm sure is also true in, in other countries, um, is a shift or a change in focus from seeing the cultural sector as primarily related to uh, intrinsic and maybe social values to talking about the cultural and creative industries with economic value. Okay? Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but we do have to wonder whether these are complementary or if they're in competition. And so as we've had a rise in the importance and the sort of policy focus on the creative industries, has this taken away focus from social and intrinsic values? So are there trade-offs? Um, some economists would say no, right? So we can use that um, uh, kind of concentric rings model at the bottom there. Um, so in the middle, we have the kind of um, very high creative content um, core activities. So we'd have things like music and performing arts. And then as you move out, it becomes more commercial. So you would have things like crafts and jewelry and, uh, and fashion and advertising around the outside. But the idea would be that they're nevertheless drawing very much of their inspiration from the core. Um, so uh, there's some who would say, no, these things are related. And then others who would say, well, yes, right? because 
uh, from a policy point of view, putting too much emphasis on economic values puts the cultural values at risk as well, right? And that's because if you're thinking of it as subsidy for the cultural sector, then your, your trade off or your, your uh, return, shall I say, is public good and social good values. But if you're thinking of it as investment in the creative industries, then you might expect some kind of um, much more monetary based return. Right, so um, culture and development in, in Africa. Um, well, um, African policy has incorporated culture into development discourse and planning for, for 40 years or more. Um, and we can find indications of this in the Organization of African Union, Unity, which became the African Union, um, in various um, plans of action. And you can see that quite early in the early 90s, we have the Dakar Plan of Action that starts talking about the cultural industries for development and the Nairobi Plan of Action, which focuses very specific on cultural and creative um, industries. So in terms of the economic, the social and the political objectives of the African Union and African policy discourse, um, the cultural industries and the cultural sector are very integrated into that. Um, there's been some criticism of these plans in the sense that they haven't really or been implemented as much as they could be. Um, and there are also commentators who are saying this is too narrow a conception of the value of culture in the African context. Um, and we need to think about it in a more, um, in a more diverse sort of way. Um, but nevertheless, there's quite a strong policy discourse around cultural and creative industries. So in order to sort of think about all of these things in a more concrete way, um, I'd like to talk about two uh, research projects I've been involved in. And the first one um, is about the repatriation of African museum artifacts, um, which may be held in, uh, in foreign museums or museums outside of Africa, um, and why this is important. And this comes back very, very much to identity. Right? So. Um, in the South African context, it's about reconstructing identity um, through decolonization and a, a re-understanding of African heritage and African stories and, and artifacts. And this has resulted in sort of renewed interest in the role of museums. So what is the role of the museum? Um, it's seen as one of the driving forces in the African re Renaissance um, in the African Union um, documents. And then also recent debates about uh, around the Black Lives Matter movement has increased sort of social pressure on Western museums that hold many of these cultural artifacts to, uh, to return them. So uh, I, I suppose the, the revitalization of this debate, which has been there for a very long time, uh, came when uh, President Macron was um, addressing a group of students in Burkina Faso in 2017, and he said, I cannot accept that a large part of cultural heritage from several African countries is in France. Um, there are historical explanations for that, but there are no valid justifications that are durable and unconditional. Um, and I think the, the scale of the, of the location of the artifacts is really quite astounding. So in the report that he commissions afterwards, um, we see that there's like 80 or 90% um, of cultural artifacts or heritage that were originally in Africa that are now in foreign museums. So arguments for the repatriation have three main pillars that we could identify in the literature. The first one is justice and the moral rights of ownership. So regardless of other values, um, it's, a, it's a just outcome to have these um, returned or at least ownership acknowledged, even if they're not actually returned. Um, and then secondly, social and cultural significance and value. So the fact that the artifacts actually make more sense or have more value in an African context for people who now have more access to those in Africa than they do in the European context. So directly opposing the kind of universal museum uh, arguments. And then there are also economic arguments, right, that having... Uh, having the, the Benin Museum built in Benin in Nigeria is going to attract a lot of tourism, but also uh, standing and research grants and um, reputational things that are associated 
uh, with the Benin bronzes um, and therefore with that museum. So what makes a cultural artifact valuable? So this is adopted from um, Throsby's uh, work and also based on, on the Bura chapter. Um, and we, we can see that there are a whole lot of different categories that we can, we can apply to a cultural artifact. Um, aesthetic, so it's something that looks beautiful or gives you some, some sense of harmony. Um, spiritual, so it may have connections with faith. Uh, social, so here we see again the shared values and beliefs. Um, historical, so there's something important related to that artifact that has meaning in a historical um, yeah, sense. Yeah. Um, symbolic, so it's something that helps communities to, um, to link with their cultural identity. Authenticity, so that means the object is real, original, um, not uh, altered or defaced, and locational, so a value that arises because the article's in a particular geographic um, place uh, in relation to where it was originally made or found um, and in relation to other um, historical artifacts. So if we think of the debate about the um, the Parthenon marbles, and you can see how this would work out. So in this research, what we did was that we um, had uh, an online questionnaire and focus group discussions um, with South African um, cultural heritage professionals. So these were people who were working with these kinds of things every day. Um, and we discussed a whole lot of different artifacts, some of those that, that I've, sh I've been uh, showing you um, in the slides and tried to come to some kind of conception or idea of what makes something valuable in the context specifically of repatriation. So uh, this was the question in deciding which artifacts should be the subject of repatriation, how important would the following characteristics be? Very important or not important on a kind of um, you know, one to five uh, scale. Um, so you can see that overwhelmingly the historical impact um, well, the historical value um, is, is kind of what most people think is, is what makes something valuable. So not actually the object in itself. So you can see that it gets, in terms of fame or beauty um, or its monetary value, um, that's not important. What's important is its historical um, connections um, and then closely followed by what it symbolizes. So that's, again, connecting to identity and um, uh, to what communities think of as, as valuable in some sense. Um, then uniqueness, right? Remember, these are cultural heritage professionals working in museums or, or in government organizations or as researchers. Um, so uniqueness matters a lot in terms of whether you would want something back um, or not. Um, and authenticity, so that, that it should be real and, and not defaced. Um, but as we were do, talking through these results in the focus group, other things kept coming to the fore. And so they kept being uh, the introduction of new kind of, of values and saying, well, it depends with how, it was, how it was obtained, right? So was this something that was bought and is now in a, in a foreign museum or is it something that was looted? So the context of its collection also came to mean a lot. And then when we talked about what would be potential repatriation options, what would be acceptable options, then the, the, the values that were sought became really important in determining what was acceptable. So for example, for justice and moral rights of ownership, if that was the main argument for repatriation, then nothing would really work other than unconditional return or sometimes legal return with the artifact being sort of on permanent loan to the foreign museum. But um, nothing else would work. Whereas if you looked at social and cultural significance, then suddenly you have a much more sort of broader um, uh, set of options. Um, it could be a permanent loan, it could be digital repatriation, it could be touring, it could be mutually beneficial repatriation options. So, um, you know, obviously the values are very much linked to sort of practical considerations. Nevertheless, the, the, um, the, although we, we're expanding our idea of what value is and how it works, um, the focus remains very much on the economic. Right? And so um, this is a sneak preview of the latest mapping study 
that the South African Cultural Observatory has produced. It will be launched on the 23rd of March. And this is basically the economics of the creative economy in South Africa. And you can see that we're tracking things like uh, economic output and so contribution to GDP, employment, so the number of jobs in the different parts of the sector, linkages to other sectors. So these are the, the multiplier effects. And then what we've sneaked in, uh, which we haven't had before, is a Gini coefficient. So looking at the distribution of income across households, right? So trying to uh, sneak in some, um, some social values there as well. Um, and so you can see that you can, you can measure these things relatively accurately and it looks sort of value free and, and unbiased. Um, but of course, well, that's not really the story, is it? Because we get very excited about the economic impacts of things. And I did lots and lots of economic impact studies for festivals and events and so on. And then we have COVID, right? So this, this is um, part of the results um, from a study done across a whole lot of African countries and, and put together by um, Bunke Tibuze, um, who kind of tried to identify why it was that the creative industries were so badly affected by the COVID-19 um, lockdowns um, and which parts of the sector were most, uh, most badly affected. Um, and you can see that as in everywhere in the country, it suddenly, I mean, the world really, it became, it became obvious that this was a very vulnerable sector in some ways, right, which we, we'd sort of known. But during periods of fast economic growth or at least economic growth, relative economic stability, um, you saw lots of information about how the creative industries were the drivers of innovation and, and economic growth and job creation. Um, and then when you have COVID, you suddenly have this frightening precarity exposed. Um, and that was because it's predominantly an informal sector um, in, in African countries. So um, even in South Africa, which is one of the most industrialized African countries, there's a much higher proportion of informal workers in the creative industries than in the other sector. And that meant that they couldn't apply for government support. So the, the small amount of government support that was made available was not um, open to people working informally who couldn't show, for example, that their contracts had been canceled um, or that their employer had said, you know, we can't employ you anymore. There's also a high proportion of freelancers. So even where people were formally registered and were taxpayers and had documentary evidence of their, their work or their firm, um, they tended to work on these short-term contracts and that's probably a worldwide phenomenon. So come together around a specific project and then when the project is finished, um, and the team breaks up. And that meant that it was very easy to cancel, postpone, or just wait until the end of those short-term contracts. Um, and also uh, the freelancers who generally uh, are employed in that way. Um, companies are very small size, so you might have a company of, of maybe two or three people, even big film companies, big film companies who have high turnovers, uh, tend to have a very small um, sort of permanent staff, um, and then they pull their specialist team together around a specific project. And for some parts of the sector, a mandatory face-to-face -face consumption and production. What we tracked in our mapping study, so you know, we have to say this doesn't all look great, um, is uh, that the creative industries were hit harder in general than, um, uh, than the rest of the economy because of these kinds of modes of production. So we can see that um, the creative industry's growth rate uh, is pretty volatile. When the economy is doing well, it certainly can grow faster. So that would be in around uh, 2017. Um, it's growing faster than the, the South African economy as a whole, um, but then it takes a serious nosedive and was in fact slowing down even before uh, COVID hit. The same thing with occupations. So cultural occupations are much more volatile than occupations in the rest of the country. Um, this is based on um, national sort of labor force surveys. Um, and you can see on the, the uh, bar graph on the right, um, the blue bars show you the change in um, kind of non-cultural occupations and the red bars show you the changes in cultural occupations. And you can see that in quarter two of 2020, so that's when we went into hard lockdown, there was a drop of like 30% of people who said they were in cultural creative occupations. 
whereas it was only around 14% of people in non-cultural occupations. So what does this mean for creative industries and in particular for the live performing arts? Um, so this is a quote that really made me think um, from um, the managers of a big, a big festival called Inibos. Um, over the years, you build up a relationship with individuals within the sponsorship corporate companies and asking them what they want to do, what they want to make out of their involvement with the festival. Is there another way besides just up to now, we've measured everything by feet on the ground or clicks on the website and that kind of thing. Um, there are no more feet on the ground at this stage or very limited. So we've got to rethink that whole module of how to calculate the sponsorship values, which I'm finding very interesting. Um, so the CEO in this case, she was saying that her thinking about what the value proposition is, um, in this case to sponsors, but they also receive public funding. So to government, right? why should you sponsor a festival or why should you invest in a festival if you're thinking creative industries, um, if you can't actually have the event? Right? So if there's the festival without the festival, uh, then what is your value? And this has really caused a, a very interesting rethink um, of how to demonstrate and to measure value. Um, and that was the subject of Future Festivals South Africa, which is an AHRC funded um, project led by Roberta Communion from King's College London. Um, and the aim was to track the COVID-19 impact um, on South African festivals. How did they adapt? And um, how can they still seek to fulfill their role um, for artists, audiences, and sponsors. And one of the first things that we did was to, to map um, what had happened to festivals. So the top map here shows you the South African festivals that were held in 2019, um, and the bottom one shows you what happened in 2020. So we went from having around 214 um, cultural or creative festivals in South Africa in 2019, um, to in 2020, we could only find 115 of them, and 28 of those happened before March, so before the lockdown. So there was almost like a 50% drop um, in the number of festivals, and some of them were we held hybrid, uh, some of them were online, some of them were later in sort of COVID-safe areas. So what, what did the festivals tell us? We, we, had, we worked with seven festival partners, um, and we asked them indirectly about how they thought about value in COVID-19 times. Um, and there were four kind of main themes that, that came out in terms of how they were thinking about uh, demonstrating and measuring their value. Um, and none of them had to do with the economic impact. Um, so first was that festivals changed their role. So instead of becoming um, content curators or gatekeepers, um, they became much more co-creators um, in this time of change and, and innovation. Um, they also saw their role as innovators and adapters. So they were kind of inventing the technologies and using the, uh, the new business models um, that they felt were also going to have an impact on the rest of the economy and even after COVID times. Um, they talked about the social role, so reaching audiences and communities even in these difficult times, and then finally, futuring and hope, so providing some kind of light um, during this very dark time. The diagram there was actually uh, made by the Cape Town Carnival that I'll talk a bit more about um, in a moment, uh, thinking about what it is that the, that the carnival does outside of the carnival. Okay, so um, reaching audiences and communities um, is a little bit more complicated in a South African context than maybe in a, in a UK or an Australian or Canadian context. Um, and that's because uh, there are really constraints in terms of what you can do online. Um, we had a look at some uh, national income and expenditure data for households, and we, we found to our sort of shock that only 9% like less than 10% of households had an internet fixed line in their household, right? So um, they would be looking at the sort of cheaper data plans um, and would maybe have broadband and, and unlimited access. But that's a tiny percentage of all South African households. 
So then we looked at people who had access via mobile phone, um, and then it went up to 54%, right? So just over half of households have access to the internet via a mobile phone, but that is the most expensive way that you can access the internet. And right? so um, considerably more expensive incidentally than data costs um, in the UK. So that really constrains um, whether you can reach audiences and communities effectively, um, even not thinking about the digital divide, right? So the fact that some groups are just much more um, confident and comfortable online or using digital technologies than others. So to try and overcome this, um, some of our festivals really um, pushed out the boat in terms of all their new ideas. Uh, the My Body, My Space uh, festival ran the whole festival on WhatsApp. It was absolutely marvelous. So they used that as a platform. And, and what they were doing was using the experiences of sharing health-related issues. So, so their original focus was around uh, HIV AIDS. Um, and they, they then use that to make these very short um, kind of mini plays or mini um, interventions from creatives, which you could access via WhatsApp, which is a really relatively cheap um, platform. Um, Buyele Kaya, who's usually a festival, means coming home. So, so they normally a festival that, that uh, happens around Christmas time when the migrant workers come back from the, the countries, from the cities to the countryside for Christmas holidays, um, then this was the, the sort of the first festival that they would have. Um, they went for television broadcast because they just knew that they weren't going to reach the people that they were looking for um, online. Um, and then the one I want to talk about a little bit more is the carnival without the carnival, right? which is the, the 2020 Cape Town carnival. Um, and you can see their poster there. Um, and just thinking about innovation, a quote from My Body, My Space, we dream a lot, but we only move on things when we're pushed. So seeing COVID as pushing. The Cape Town Carnival was an interesting one for us because um, I'd just done an, an economic impact study for them um, sort of the year before COVID hit. Right? So they take, it takes place in Cape Town, which, as you may know, is the second largest city in South Africa. It's got 3.7 million people, um, an unemployment rate of 24%, which is actually quite low in the in South African um, context. Most people in formal housing <clears throat> and a mixture of different cultures and, and languages. Um, a big international and local um, tourism cluster, and then they're a design capital and known as for their film industry cluster. So they're, they're quite an active city, I'd say, in terms of the creative industries. The carnival goals were to have a, well, a world-class event that is safe and well-attended, right? So that was their first goal. Um, but the way that the carnival was put on was that they, um, they saw social cohesion and, and skills at the building as, as a big part of what they do. So the, they work with um, community groups, local schools, um, particularly in disadvantaged sort of areas, poorer areas in the Cape Flats, um, throughout the year to, uh, to design their float, their costumes, and to choreograph the performance or the dance that they do at the carnival. And to assist them, um, they employ professional um, set designers, choreographers, um, and, and costume makers. Um, to work with the different groups in order to, to make the carnival happen. Um, so they have this behind the scenes, um, really big kind of social cohesion, um, networking, skills building um, a program. But for most of, of what the city saw was a one day event, right? So it's free entrance. Uh, the year that we looked, they, they attracted around 45,000 audience uh, members or crowd, if you like, um, and they had nearly 1,400 parade participants. And as you can imagine, that had a certain economic impact on the city, and it was really the numbers that they were looking for. So then in 2020, the lockdown happens just before the carnival event itself is going to take place. Um, so there's complete cancellation of the main event and no possibility of rescheduling it or um, doing a smaller things or anything like that. It was just from, you know, gearing up to have this thing to absolutely nothing. And so 
Um, I assumed that that would be complete disaster. Um, but in fact, um, it wasn't. So when we talked to the CEO, uh, she said, well, the thing is that the events, the cherry on top, there's no question about it. The carnival parade is the icing and the cherry and the balloons and the champagne. But if we had to only have the event and not the other stuff, then it would have been devastating because there'd be nothing. But our purpose is social cohesion and development of arts and culture and job creation and training and all of that, which is really the stuff that's actually quite difficult and quite heartwarming. So what they did was that they said, well, we can still be um, true to our, to our mandate. We can still have online training workshops. We can still have discussions, performance demonstrations. We can still support communities through um, food parcels and kind of outreach activities, even though there was no carnival event. And that really made them think about what exactly the values of that, um, of that event were. Um, I could talk a lot more about the, the future festivals um, project, but I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the time. So um, let me move on and maybe I can come back to some of those things again. Um, okay, so what, how does value and valuation feed into cultural policy? Well, in South Africa, we've had three white papers on arts, culture, and heritage since the end of apartheid, uh, the 2013 one being withdrawn. Um, and there's been a kind of a, a swing of the pendulum um, from focusing very much on the social and intrinsic values of culture um, to being almost exclusively focused on the cultural and creative industries. That was the 2013 one, which was withdrawn, to the 2017 one, which is kind of back to the middle where both kinds of value are, um, all three kinds of value are um, accepted. Um, and, and there's space for that, right? Um, but there's still this sort of quite significant focus on the economic, and that's exactly the one that seems to have been disappearing um, during COVID-19. Um, part of the work of the South African Cultural Observatory is to help to um, demonstrate and measure cultural value um, in order to make good policy decisions. And so one of the, some of the work that we did was to come up with with a kind of a relatively simple monitoring and evaluation framework for publicly funded goods in the first instance or, or events, um, but um, also including private, privately funded um, goods and services. Um, and, and what we tried to do was to say, okay, economic growth and job creation is part of it, right? But there's so many other indicators that you could be using in order to demonstrate your value. And we came up with these sort of five big uh, value headings and then underneath of those some um, indicators. And the idea was that if you're a small uh, local uh, cultural dance festival, then you wouldn't report on all of these, right? You might focus on only one or two. Um, if you're a big national uh, public art event, then you would probably include a wider range of these kinds of, of values. Um, and we made some progress towards encouraging organizations to report into this um, kind of structure to make their value that they were producing, but to make it visible, right? And to think about other kinds of value that they could be producing. Um, more recently, we've had something called the South African Creative Industries Master Plan. Um, and this is part of South Africa's reimagined industrial strategy, which identified um, important sectors in order to develop these master plans for. Um, and to our delight, the creative industries was recognized um, as one of them. So the answer was then, well, you know, where, where are you going? What does this plan look like? Um, and so in thinking about this, um, we tried to do it in, in a sort of a whole systems way. Um, so to have the, the base of our kind of strategy house um, resting on um, the environment where all creatives can flourish and partnerships that foster creativity and transformation where we have a much more representative um, sector for talent and then to bring this together by looking at both demand and supply side because one of the problems with, um, with our cultural policy has been a very heavy focus on supply side 
um, without thinking about how does this interact with um, the people who are going to be participating or consuming. Um, so we tried to include both. Um, and this was the kind of one shot of this gigantic um, document, which don't worry, I'm not going to sort of try and zoom through now. Um, but just to give you a sense of the, the way that we were seeing this all fitting together, incorporating both market and non-market um, values and, and ways of, of understanding um, the, whole, the whole system. Okay, so, so finally then just to, to wrap up, because I see I'm edging towards the 45 um, minutes, uh, how to bring this all together. Um, I think that, that some of the new thinking in the, uh, about culture and value, value to society, has shifted away from the dominance of economic values. And that's maybe been speeded up by the fact that COVID-19 had such a, such a significant impact on the sector. And maybe there's more space now for trans and multidisciplinary work where you can have multiple indicators that take into account things like context and justice. Um, and there, there's sort of two interesting components here in terms of how to actually practically do this. Um, some of you may already know about deliberative valuation or deliberative monetary valuation, which is being used quite extensively in um, environmental and ecological economics, which says, look, some of these values are socially constructed, right? They're not individualistic. So valuation methods that ask individualistic questions, how much are you willing to pay, right? What activities are you doing? Are kind of missing the point. We need to find a way of understanding um, shared social values. And one way is to allow a kind of deliberative process that leads to social learnings so that we can actually um, get a sense of, well, these are some of the differing views and the same views, and this is how society or a particular community um, values something. Haven't seen it used for uh, in, in the cultural sector yet. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think it's gonna be very interesting. Um, and it'll take us right back to, to Throsby's 2001 work, where he says the problem with culture is that it is essentially social. And so when you try and use economic tools to value it, um, those are essentially individualistic, right? So it's about individual utility theory and choice. Um, and so there's a kind of a mismatch there. So I think deliberative valuation might give us a, a really good conceptual and methodological framework to take some of these ideas forward. Um, I was also recently looking at the valuing culture and heritage capital framework that was um, uh, put out last year by uh, DCMS. Um, and it was kind of heartened by this, although it's very economic speak in the sense that we've got you know, discount rates and we've got a stock of capital that you invest in. Um, in order to receive a flow of benefits. So, you know, it's, it's, it's using the economic terminology, but it is thinking about things in a systems wide way. So rather than just a very narrow focus on one aspect, like let's take cultural tourism and value that, right? This is a, I think a much broader, more sustainable way of thinking about those things. Um, so I'm looking forward to seeing how this debate develops um, in the post COVID era. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jen, um, for that very rich and wide ranging keynote, um, giving us a terrific uh, overview of debates around cultural value and their application within the South African context in particular. Thank you so much. Um, I um, am now going to invite questions from our audience. Um, you are very welcome to raise your hand if you would be um, happy to ask a question in person. That would be terrific to see some faces. If you prefer, you're also welcome to put a question in the chat box and we can um, relay the question to Jen in that way. So whilst you're gathering your thoughts, any questions, very welcome. It could also be a comment or observation if you prefer. Um, perhaps I'll just get the ball rolling with a question. There are many questions that I could ask Jen, but maybe I'll begin by thinking about the way in which 
cultural value is a discourse and a topic which is really interestingly located between academia, policy making, and public debate. And whether you might say something a bit more about SACO, the South African Cultural Observatory, as an organization that is sort of placed in the middle of that ecology between academics and policymakers and the public, and what SACO's role can be or has been in kind of setting agendas or receiving agendas around which dimensions of value matter. I don't know if you could speak a bit further to that. Um, sure, yes, um, thank you. So the, the South African Cultural Observatory is funded by the National Department of Sports, Arts and Culture, but it's, it's embedded into public universities. Right? So there's a sort of partnership of, of four public universities and um, we, we appear to be bigger than we are. Um, there's a nice website to try and encourage everyone to have a look at um, with all of our research. Um, but our role is really to provide industry and policy relevant information. So we're all academics, um, but, but what we need to be doing is, is sort of this relatively high quality research, hopefully, um, into things that matter for the industry and for policy. And that's been really interesting um, because it's brought sort of these three groups together. So we do workshops all over the country um, with creatives and arts managers and um, intermediaries uh, and policymakers um, to find out what it is that they would like to know more about. And then uh, you know, we go off and do the research and kind of report back. Um, and we also can talk directly to national government, which is really, um, it's interesting. It's a, it's a privilege. Uh, it's a frustration, I won't, I won't lie, um, can be extremely frustrating process. Um, but you, you kind of get to get to see things from the point of view of the, the individual arts organization, as well as from the policymaker at regional level and at national level. Um, and then you have your hat on as an academic as well. So, so it's a really interesting sort of um, space. It definitely keeps you honest. So if you know that you're going to be presenting your results to the people who are the real experts in the industry, uh, then you know you really make sure that you've done your research very, very well. Um, in terms of the agenda, we do have a certain amount of freedom there. So uh, for example, we've, we've pushed for the, the monitoring and evaluation framework used by the Department of Arts and Culture in deciding which policies uh, or which things to, um, to subsidize. Um, we, we've pushed for a sort of more holistic approach and we've done a lot of training around those kinds of things. We've provided tools for that sort of training. Um, but in the end, you know, uh, you, you also have to take note of what the sort of political imperatives are. Um, so the reason that we have the mapping studies is that we know that the department has to feed into bigger national policy and the national development plan um, talk, you know, it talks about the, the problems with unemployment, um, skills development, poverty, and low growth. And so you have to have, your department has to show somehow how they're contributing to those bigger, um, those bigger picture things as well. Yeah. That's, that's very interesting. Thank you, Jen. Um, I wonder if there are some questions emerging from our audience, from our participants. Um, as you continue to gather your thoughts, I can ask some further questions, maybe maybe around sort of, oh, I can see a hand up. Eka, great. Let's, um, let's hear from Eka. Hopefully your camera will turn on. Right, hello. Um, I don't know what's going on with my camera, but, but that's okay. Um, just to say thank you so much, uh, Professor Snowball. That was really, really fascinating. Um, I'm really interested, your conversation about the repatriation, um, you know, the, some of the results that you shared. I was quite keen to understand who you spoke to in that research and if it's possible to delineate who prioritized various forms of value. I'm asking that because I'm, I'm keen to understand also in your opinion, you know, what do you think will prevail when we think of, um, you know, the which values will be prioritized and the kind of actions that are taken around this very pertinent issue? Um, you know, you spoke of the just, you know, justice and uh, moral um, reasonings behind some of the actions. 
uh, social and cultural and economic as well. With a lot of what you've spoken about, we see how sort of an economic deterministic approach eats, um, you know, being the most influential factor here. Do you think we're going to see that again in the, you know, how these debates around repatriation of these artifacts are developed? Thanks. Great. Um, thank you. Yeah, that, that was fascinating um, research, which we've um, we've just published in the International Journal of Cultural Policy. So um, more details there. Um, I can't really divide up the um, the results by sort of very specifically who we spoke to, um, because people were uh, were quite um, reluctant to to reveal their personal details, so it wasn't it was an anonymous survey. But we asked people, you know, what can you tell us your sort of your position, um, and or at least the, the number of years you've been in your position, and um, that's why we followed up with a sort of a, um, a focus group to unpack those results a little bit more, is to try and try and understand it. Um, I guess the biggest. The biggest split was actually between those um, professionals who worked with cultural heritage. Um, and they were mostly people who were like in museum studies or were from the South African Heritage Resources Agency, which is a government agency in charge of, uh, of South African heritage of national importance. Um, some of them were researchers. Um, some of them worked in museums as curators or collection managers. Um, as some were more on the fine arts side. So, so it was kind of a mixture of people who did this kind of thing in their everyday jobs. So I guess you could think of it as a sort of an expert um, panel. But the, the big split came between those people who, who did not want repatriation and those who did. Um, and so there were arguments on both sides. So for on, on the sides of, of those who did want repatriation, um, it was actually the sort of justice and moral rights of ownership and then the issues around access, and right? so education and social values, that were the ones that were most uh, often uh, commented on. Um, and looking at the sort of international debates, it looks as though those are going to be the values that have carried the most weight. So in that debate, um, saying, well, we, we need to have this big museum because it's a way of attracting tourists and uh, generating income, that hardly ever gets mentioned. And if you have a look at the, what they said was important, things that would attract tourists like fame and monetary value and aesthetics, they didn't care about that at all. Right? So that, that didn't come into it. Um, they were really thinking about the kind of historical heritage, social value of these artifacts or the justice of having, having them um, return. Um, and in, in the debates I've seen recently about museums that have decided to return artifacts, um, that's been the main thing that they talked about, right? That no one said, well, we think it's only fair that, um, that, that you get a chance to make some money out of this, right? That's almost not discussed. It's, it's kind of, uh, you know, don't mention money, much more important things. Um, whereas when you looked at festivals, then the economic was there kind of all the time, right? So they've really bought into the kind of creative industries um, discourse. Um, so in the, in the museums, um, well, the museum artifact debate, um, I think it is going to be the moral rights and it's going to be the um, social values linked to identity that are, is going to be the main thing. Um, and the people who did not want the artifacts returned, incidentally, in case you worry, you, you weren't wondering about that, um, they, they were worried about the ability of South African museums, which some of which are quite under-resourced, um, to actually hang on to these and properly protect and preserve um, these um, artifacts. They were saying, well, no, they're actually safer um, in the big foreign museums. So, so there the money and resources um, did come into it. Um, and we, we didn't have anybody in our panel, but in other reports, um, there have been people saying, well, these, article, these artifacts are too valuable. So their value um, on the sort of open market is massive. Um, and so the concern is that if you give them to a publicly run museum, um, security is going to become a big issue, right? Because um, stealing them wouldn't be all that difficult. And we know there's a huge kind of um, illegal market um, for these sort of things that we're saying, well, just because they're safer there for now, you know? So that seemed to be the big debate. 
I don't know if I really answered your question, but um, yeah, give it a go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Jen, and thank you, Eka, for the question. Um, great. Any any further questions or comments from the floor? Very welcome. I have some more of my own whilst people continue to gather their thoughts. Um, Jen, I've got a couple of questions around the kinds of place of South Africa in conversations around cultural value, um, given that this is a kind of an international co conversation in, in various ways. Um, towards the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that there have been discourses around culture and development across Africa for 40 years or so. So it's quite an established conversation, but there have been perhaps limitations to the actual implementation of, of that kind of policy approach. So I was just wondering if South Africa is, in a sense, a leading voice within that conversation or um, what the other kind of centres of gravity might be within that conversation or any sort of further reflections on that kind of continent-wide uh, discourse? Sure. Um, well, I, I mean, I think South Africa is to a certain extent um, a leader um, because just from an economic power base point of view, but we also have strong voices coming from Nigeria um, particularly around things like the Benin bronzes and also from Ethiopia, if you think of um, Timbuktu, you know, and those kinds of historical sites. So, um, yeah, the, I mean, probably it's fairly strong. It's difficult for me to kind of um, imagine that. Um, but it's, it's, it's also, it's, uh, you remember the idea of the African Renaissance. I think that was sort of part of, of, way, of thinking about culture and creativity and innovation in Africa. Um, but what really changed everything, I have to say, and, uh, was the financial crisis in 2008, um, because uh, South Africa certainly never really recovered from that. So we didn't go into recession, but um, the economy just never bounced back. So we went from a sort of relatively high growth, upwardly trending cycle, uh, right back down to kind of um, very low growth um, recession. And what tends to happen in that situation is that the policy discourse changes to um, understandably be about jobs and, and growth and, and poverty reduction. Um, and so I, I think that in a, to a certain extent, the creative industries discourse fed into that, um, sort of Africa-wide, but also in South Africa. So it becomes um, the sort of a form of policy attachment in a way, right? So I can see these are the big issues of the day. So I have to attach myself to that. Um, otherwise, um, I'll just be left behind and have my budget cut, you know, so you can sort of see how um, how departments of arts and culture would think in that way and, and then be, be kind of encouraged into this um, very economic way of thinking about things. Um, but yeah, I, I think that it's, it's such a diverse continent, you know, I, I can't even, I'm not even sure I've got a proper picture of how it works in my head. Um, but uh, there, there's the interesting revival happening um, in lots of places. And I think we're also paying attention to HIVA in Kenya. Um, which is looking at ways of being a kind of creative industries incubator on kind of microeconomic scale. Um, and then there's also big success stories in, in other more tech sectors. So if we're thinking about Nigeria and Nollywood, you know, so everyone's wondering how, the, how they did that with like no copyright practically. Um, and, um, and we're also looking at video games emerging in, in some places. So there's lots of kind of activity um, but I'm not sure we could tie it down to a specific country or centre. Great, thank you, Jen. Um, and just to mention that um, tomorrow there's a launch event as part of King's Africa Week for a new centre for um, sustainable um, creative economies in Africa. I can see one of the leads for that project, Lauren England, is with us today. So if you're interested, that event is tomorrow at 11 a.m. UK time, where I'm sure there'll be conversations about South Africa, which is one of the partners, but also Nigeria, Kenya, and a fourth country that escapes my memory for the time being. But um, yes, <laughs> thanks, Lauren. Um, any other questions from the floor, comments, 
observations, connections. Let's see, I think there's something in the Q&A here. Um, so someone asks, can PhD researchers contact Dr. Snowball about their work related to the CCIs in Africa? So very practical question. That's fine, yes, you're yes. welcome. <laughs> great, thank you for that. Um, and now let's have a look. Okay, great. Um, so um, a further kind of international dimension to this is the discourse and debate around cultural value in the UK. So um, in 2016, as you'll know, Jen, there was the publication of the cultural value report by the AHRC yeah. came out of three years of lots of different projects exploring cultural value uh, from lots of different angles, which in a sense came out of a few years of conversation in the UK, which was generating perhaps more heat than light around cultural value. And so <laughs> that project was to say, let's, let's take a step back and see how we can understand cultural from value from all of these different perspectives. So I guess I might um, invite you to say something about how you see the kind of international dimensions of those, those debates sort of um, from the UK, some of the work you cited obviously comes from Australia and there's lots of work there. Do you feel that there's a kind of internationalization of these conversations that is happening or, or what's South Africa's role in that? Yeah, yeah, I think to a certain extent there is. So certainly when we were developing the monitoring and evaluation framework, for example, we looked at the cultural value project project. project. Um, and I think that, that there are aspects of that that are feeding into the sort of cultural heritage capital project. So um, more heat than light, I, I kind of like that one, right? So there, there were lots of ideas in the cultural value um, project, but um, very difficult sometimes to operationalize those, right? And so I think that the, the, the challenge is you have, you generate the value and then you have to demonstrate the value and then you have to measure the value, right? So the value can be there, but if you can't demonstrate it, um, then you can't measure it. And if you can't measure it, then it's very difficult to find a way of incorporating it into policy. So I think that the, the new framework around cultural heritage capital is trying to say, okay, you know, out of all of these values, how can we have a workable way of measuring this value to some extent, right? And no measurement's ever going to be perfect. And, and I think that that's another thing to acknowledge is sometimes it's better to have something than nothing. Right? The problem with the, with the economic valuation all over the world is that it, it's people think it's everything, right? whereas in fact, it's only one aspect of whatever um, cultural um, event or um, museum or artifact you're trying to measure. One very small aspect might not be the most important, you know? So... Um, I think that that um, internationally the debate is moving that way. Um, where I think that Africa might have something interesting to say um, is around social values and the construction of social values, um, because the the sort of the African philosophies around things like Ubuntu, I am because you are, you know. So it's it's always felt a bit strange to. Um, to have this individualistic mode of value measurement or creation um, in a context where society is absolutely central um, to the identity and self-worth of, of everyone, right? So it's not an individualistic, primarily an individualistic kind of society. Um, and so that's why I'm, I'm quite fascinated by the deliberative um, valuation methods because I think those are going to be very interesting and so I've seen some I've seen some lovely um, examples of how this can be used for environmental goods uh, and services or ecological in ecological study um, so far I haven't seen any in, in cultural studies so that's a challenge to all of you researchers out there right how can we use this um, and it's so perfect because cultural value is about identity which is about meaning and um, socially constructed meaning. Um, so that's definitely something that, that I'm hoping is going to come out as an interesting way. And these are very international kind of um, debates and, and ideas, you know, I don't think they're, 
coming specifically from one place or from another, but they fit better in different contexts. Um, and I mean, I think there's also interesting work coming out around the gig economy, right? So this is seen in the UK, I think, as quite a threat, you know. Um, it's a low, uh, low security kind of work and, and sometimes not well paid and um, informal. Um, whereas most of Africa's economy has been informal like forever. That, that's the normal mode of um, uh, the normal mode of, of operation is, is informal. Um, but then uh, there is security and it comes from networks. It comes from really strong social networks. And so this could be one place where Africa has something to say about um, the creative economy and how, how people work in the creative economy. Um, and because for us, it's, it's kind of standard, right? Whereas in, in more developed countries, it's kind of, uh, you know, an, an outlier. Um, what was the term I saw? Um, Non-standard non forms of work or something like that, you know? Uh, whereas for us, it's almost the other way around. Like most, of the, most people are employed in the creative, uh, in any industry, but especially in the creative industry, informally. Um, and then their ways of managing that through social networks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that there are some interesting um, contextual factors that can be useful internet, for international study. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. very interesting, Jen. And, and just to pick up on that theme of uh, precarity and perhaps what might be learned from the South African context in terms of precarious uh, conditions of work within cultural and creative sectors. Um, one of the observations that is often made in terms of um, informal economies is that the challenge is that it's harder to find policy instruments to support people working within them. On the one hand, as you indicate, there could be really interesting kind of examples of existing practice of mutual support that can be shared internationally. But I wonder in the context of COVID, how the South African government is seeking to support informal uh, sectors of the economy. Are there solutions? Yeah, it's a tough one, isn't it? Yeah, um, I mean, they, they realized very quickly that it was really difficult to support, especially creatives who didn't have contracts. So people were saying, well, uh, I'm a freelancer, I work as an, as an actor, uh, and, uh, and I didn't sort of register myself as a business for tax. No one told me to. I didn't think of it, you know. And so uh, someone else saying, well, I'm a sound engineer and my contracts are via WhatsApp. You know, people send me a, a thing saying, can you do this job for this amount of money? And, and then that's what I do. Um, and there isn't a contract sort of beyond that. So it, it all works on these kind of really well-established networks and reputations. Um, and, and, and it works really well, right? So the transaction costs are, are, are low, um, but for sure, um, very difficult to find ways to support people in that sector. Um, the government did, they, they did become more open to, um, to, to things like saying, well, if you have any evidence of the contract or you have somebody who says, well, I, I am employing this person, even though you know, they're not registered or whatever, um, then they could apply for, for support. But, um, in the, for the most part, it wasn't available to, to people who weren't registered for, for tax in some form. Um, what has happened is that um, creative industries incubators have started programs to help people to, to register, to say, well, it's not that expensive, it's not that difficult, um, and there are these benefits that could really help you. So, so at the moment, there's a big project running through the creative industries incubator in Johannesburg called Let's Get Formal, you know, and it's, it's kind of trying to encourage creatives and to help them to register um, for themselves as a freelancer or as a business um, so that they can actually access some of the government support and apply for the available funds. Of course, the downside of that is you do have some paperwork to do, right? And when your earnings are above a certain amount, um, you are liable for, for tax. And I think that um, because the people's... Um, uh, earnings are quite erratic. They were sort of worried. What if I register for tax, and then people, you know, how how will that affect my um, uh, my business viability and so on going forward? So I think there are still some challenges there, um, but they did find ways of working out, um, even in the informal sector, um, who needed support. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it would be 
lovely to hear from one or two more people in the audience. I don't know if anyone wants to kind of share um, an insight into their own work in this area. If we have people in the room who either work in the creative industries or are studying the creative industries, anyone would like to share what their interest is in this space. Um, all comments and contributions very welcome. Um, whilst people continue to gather their thoughts, ah, oh, there's one from Eka. Jen, does your study on the impact of COVID suggest that moments of crisis can enable rene renegotiation of the overwhelming focus on economic value and thinking about value, i.e. giving greater weight to other aspects, e.g. social value? Yeah, I I'm hope so. Um, so um, it, it might be too early to say um, in the sense that um, uh, I think a, a lot of these um, organizations that were relying very much on economic impact right, as their main value proposition are now trying to think of other ways to demonstrate their value and their impact um, because the, the economic just isn't there. Um, and we've seen a fair amount of that, actually. Um, if I could just... Do you mind if I share my screen again, Jonathan? So I had some sort of hidden slides, you know, as one does, things that you knew you probably wouldn't be able to fit in, but hoped you could. Um, so um, what I've just wanted to talk about a bit is from the Future Festivals um, uh, study, um, we had this wonderful um, intervention, which, which I sort of hadn't come across before, research method that led actually by Jonathan um, on, on futuring. So people were asked to write a letter to themselves from 2030 about how you experience the festival back in, you know, in, in 2030, but you're writing to yourself in, in 2022. Um, and some of these resulted in, I mean, really quite moving things like the quote at the bottom, you know, today we're here again, it's packed with people. Uh, we celebrate the fruits delivered from creativity during COVID-19 and we stand stronger and more, more resilient. Um, but what was it that people were kind of missing the most and what did they value the most? So what did they want back in terms of these um, events? And so if we look at um, themes of values from this big uh, festival called Anibos, um, you can see that the focus is really experiential, right? So it provides opportunities for people to be together, to enjoy art uh, and music together, um, to, to, to be ways for emerging artists to create the networks that they need to promote their work um, and relating to promoting arts and South African culture. So it really became a way of um, uh, allowing people to express the things that they valued the most um, about the festivals that had happened in the past and also kind of going forward. Um, as part of the Futuring project, we also had a song competition, which was, was really great. And, and we did the, um, a collage of, with the National Arts Festival, which kind of made very visible the role of the festival in building social cohesion in the town, which is still quite divided along sort of race income lines um, and thinking about space and place and the importance of that. So, um, you know, these are all ways that festivals were much more open to, I think, in terms of sort of working with us around these things um, than they would have been, right? Because even, um, you know, a few years ago, getting them to do anything other than the economic impact study, we'd sort of smuggle a few questions in there about social value and, um, uh, and personal uh, capital and so on, um, cultural capital, um, they, they just weren't interested in. Right? So they, they really weren't interested in non-market valuation methods, whereas this time around, they were much, much more open to that, um, which I think is a sign that they've realized that if, you, if you're just gonna collect up information about people's spending, um, when there wasn't, there was almost none, you know. So none of these big festivals that moved online were really successful with monetization. That's the other thing, was that they might have had benefits in terms of continuity and reaching audiences and providing work for artists and innovation, 
um, but none of them were making money. And, and it's only because their sponsors continued to support them that they actually could still continue to operate. Thanks, Jen. Yeah, and great, great to have that image of the of the collage uh, on the screen. Um, we have we have a question here which asks: um, Does your study, does your research look into the economic and professional support required to support the growth of CCI participants? Are accountants and lawyers equipped and tooled to support the formalization of workers? Yeah, great question. Um, part of the Creative Industries Master Plan is actually a sort of skills audit, right? So to try and determine um, what are the missing skills in the in the sector, um, and it's it's often that overlap between business and the and the creative industries that's that's missing, and that's because um, a lot of South African university education is still in, in silos to some extent. So if you go and do music and drama, uh, at no point does somebody say, and this is how you fill in a tax return, you know, or how are you going to decide um, what ticket price to charge? You know, that's, that's kind of um, not part of, of what studying music or drama or literature is about at most South African universities. And that, that is starting to, um, that is starting to, to break down and to, to change. Um, and, and there are also shortages in terms of um, technical skills. So when we were talking to the video games and animation companies, they were saying, well, we've got lots of artistic and creative people, um, but they're not very good computer programmers, right? And so, so we need to have that kind of intersection of the, the technological and the business and the creative um, in order to, I think, really make this a, a success. Um, so one of the things that's, that's offered is... Um, that we have a government sector education training authorities, and they offer kind of accredited short courses within their sector. Um, and so we're trying to kind of encourage them to, to meet some of these gaps, right, or to fill some of these gaps um, at a kind of post-school and higher education level. Um, and then in the higher education system, um, some of us are kind of saying, well, you know, how about inviting um, a tax consultant or an economist to come and talk to students studying music or drama or literature. Um, and equally, um, can we get your students to come and talk to our students about creative processes and, and innovation? So I think that, you know, there is some work that's happening to break down those kinds of silos. In terms of specialist sort of creative industries lawyers, there are very few and far between or accountants, you know, so... Um, I was lucky enough to find an academic one in um, Professor Inyana Nwache, who's a creative industries copyright lawyer, and that's his kind of his job. And he worked with us on the um, uh, the repatriation um, of African artifacts. Um, so he was, yeah, he he was, but he's a rare, rare beast in terms of um, skills profile. Yeah. Thanks, Jen. And um, we actually have uh, another question related to skills, but at the level of organisations rather than individuals. So Lauren asks, thinking about the measurement processes, do arts and cultural organisations have the skill sets to do this and evaluate their work effectively? Or does it require organisations like SACO and higher education institutions to support this work? Also thinking of time and labor required to do evaluation and how this might be quite intense, especially if wanting to use more in-depth deliberative evaluations. Yeah. Well, I mean, that is kind of the nub of it, isn't it? That um, what we were trying, what SACO was trying to do was to develop a relatively simple framework that could be applied by um, arts organizations themselves. So we had handbooks and training manuals and online economic impact calculator and so on. Um, to, because we acknowledge that these monitoring and evaluation is not for free, right? It takes time and energy and it's, it's costly in terms of, um, even if you're doing it internally, the time that you've spent doing that, right? Um, and so we, we, tried to, we tried to emphasize this as well, that in your, in your, actually in your application for funding, whether it's to a a private sector sponsor or, or, or the public sector, 
you almost need to have an item there, which we tried to make mandatory, which didn't work. Um, we gave it a shot um, for monitoring and evaluation, right, or whatever you wanted to call it. Um, and, and we specifically steered away from words like impact, right, because that implies kind of quantitative methods. Um, but, but for sure, in a lot of especially smaller arts organizations um, or cultural sectors that haven't sort of thought about themselves in that way, there isn't the expertise, right? And so um, there's a thriving kind of very expensive private consultancy sort of business that's popped up around this. Um, not always producing very good uh, quality um, reports, um, but yeah, it's about, I think, capacity building. And, and we had sort of different layers that you could use. So you could go for kind of relatively um, inexpensive in terms of time, expertise, and effort, um, internal monitoring um, or reporting structure, where you could use things like photographs and mini minutes from meetings and crowd counts and, you know, um, feedback from educators or whatever to, to kind of um, track that um, right through to the full, you know, deliberative focus group economic modeling kind of um, approach. So we tried to, we tried to make it so that it was within the grasp of everyone um, to, um, to do something, even if not, you know, even if we didn't need or couldn't afford um, the big um, monitoring and evaluation or, you know, the complete holistic version. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Jen. So we're almost out of time, but I'd like to squeeze in maybe just one final question myself to connect um, this conversation very directly to the, the overall theme of Africa Week around putting culture and creativity to the centre and the question that uh, Africa Week is posing around how can cultural and creative economy and related research inform other disciplines and ways of doing things. And just to sort of ask Jen, if you have any final thoughts around the, the, the diversity of types of value that your research um, sort of points towards, does that have the capacity perhaps through SACO and, and other routes to kind of informing uh, broader conversations within the policy space within South Africa? So on the one hand, you mentioned policy attachment and it can be sort of ways in which uh, the cultural sector has imposed upon it certain ways of doing things. But I, I wonder if you have any thoughts about how the cultural sector could act, actually perhaps inform conversations more broadly? Sure. That's quite a question to ask me at like <laughs> five minutes to four. Jumping. My my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take revenge later. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's actually it's it's a it's a great question. Um, and it is something we've been thinking about because um, South Africa is actually in the process of having a draft policy on science, technology and innovation. Um, and it's very, very STEM focused, right? So um, it, it doesn't really make space for the kind of innovation and creative processes that we're seeing coming out of the, the creative sector. Um, and so one of the places where SACO and, and others have been trying to intervene is to say, well, you need to interview um, creatives as well, right? So you can't just talk to uh, scientists and engineers and, and mathematicians, right? You also need to um, talk to, to the creative sector to find out how innovation happens and how innovation is happening, um, especially around business models linked to, as we were talking about, the gig economy, right? So if we're seeing the rise in that kind of production model, then it makes sense to say, well, here's a sector who's been doing it forever. Um, let's ask them, you know, how they actually um, have, been, have been managing this kind of thing and how innovation works in really small firms that don't have gigantic labs and hundreds of people employed. So um, we think that there really is capacity for, for the creative industries to feed into that policy um, debate. Um, and we, yeah, it's too early to say if we've had any success, but we've certainly had some conversations around shifting that debate um, to be uh, inclusive of, of arts, culture and heritage as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jen. It was um, 
an extremely effective uh, and concise answer to my uh, big question right at the end there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, well, we are almost out of time. So um, first of all, just to say a huge thank you to Professor Snowball for her terrific keynote and for all of the answers that she's given to our questions. Um, thank you to everyone for coming, to the organizers. Um, just to mention that um, King's Africa Week continues over the next couple of days. Um, and there are keynotes coming up um, tomorrow and on Wednesday. I'm just going to post a link or two into, ah, there they are already, fantastic, brilliant. You can see in your chat uh, box some further keynotes, which may very well be of interest to you over the next couple of days. So do check those out. Um, and just to just to end by saying thank you again to Jen for um, for everything um, that you've shared with us today. So thanks so much. Pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me. Great. Okay. Bye. Have a good afternoon, everyone. <laughs>